Okay. Yep. All right, we are gonna go ahead and get started here. If everyone else can stay on mute, we will have um, an opportunity for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, if you do wanna speak at the end, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll ask that you state your name and the address um, within the district before you speak, and then you can go ahead and address Scott. He will be presenting today, and then he will be able to respond to you. So I'm going to give everybody an opportunity to speak at least once, depending on what the demand is. And everyone will have three minutes. When we go through all the cards, the, the comments, and the Zoom questions, if, if there is an interest in time permitting, then we can we can revisit if someone you know thinks of something that they forgot to mention or wants to add. And then certainly, if in the course of the public comment, you don't think your question or comments getting put out there, we'll have cards for you to fill out. Um, so hopefully that, that makes sense. And then what I'll, all I'll do is I'll just ask you, when you stand up, we are subject to the Open Meetings Act, so I'm going to ask, if, if you do want to speak, stand up, state your name, name and your address. And then you'll have a few minutes to either ask the questions or make the comments, if that makes sense. So I think, given that, so a uh, tentative agenda, are we set, Autumn, on your side? Okay, so I guess I'll start out, can everyone hear me? If you can, I know you can't answer, so. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you about that. So my name is Scott Miller. I'm the Deputy Water Resources Commissioner in Washington County. Uh, I'm gonna pretty much do the presentation tonight, so one of my responsibilities um, as, as a deputy, of, uh, I, I handle the engineering um, plus the lake levels, including Loop Dam and the supporting the line lake, lake levels. So that's that's a program under my direction. Um, we have two counties represented tonight. So there are Livingston County properties as well as Washtenaw properties within the district. So both um, our water resource commissioners, drain commissioners, so Brian and John here from Livingston is with us, Evan Pratt, the Washtenaw Commissioner. I'm sure everyone has heard of them before, right? <laughs> Your elected officials, well-known post. Um, they're with us. I know Mitch from Livingston is with us. We did invite some of the local officials, like the uh, local township uh, board of commissioners, if, if, if they're, they had an interest or were able to make it, if, if they're here, definitely welcome to all of you. And briefly, I will. I do want to recognize our staff. So, Autumn, Chris, and Nicole, and Marcel are all the ones that really did the, the, all the work in pulling this together, getting the meeting together, getting the sign ins, getting everything set up. So, uh, essentially, we couldn't have done this without them. But what I wanted to do, and again, I, I don't have 
maybe 20, 25 minutes or so. I'll talk a little bit about the history of the lake level and the dam. Uh, I want to talk about the dam and the current status of the dam and the lake level. We, have, we did have a dam failure um, early in the year, so I want to talk about that and the timeline and the process to repair that failure. Um, we'll, we'll definitely want to spend time on the special assessment district. So just as a, a preview, um, we, we operate under a, a state law, it's a Public Act 451 for those who are familiar with you know, environmental laws. Part 307, so we're not part of the lake improvement board process, you know, the weed management, things, things like that. We operate under the state legislative act. Um, it's a little peculiar in that the way we get money, which I know a lot of you are interested in, the way we get money to pay for this, it's not done, uh, uh, you know, what I would say is a common sense or an intuitive way. Um, the assessment process is, uh, takes a little explaining. So I definitely want to take time to explain what the special assessment district is and, and how we, we pay for things. Uh, and then I really wanted to just leave it open for those uh, who have comments or questions about the process or the district or anything in general. So uh, sound good? Okay. Um, I know not all, I guess I'm going to, I had originally intended to say I'm not going to read this because everyone knows how to read, but I'm gathering probably a good half of you or more can't read this. So, I can't read it. So, so I guess I am going to, you got to forgive me. So I guess um, I will kind of read out a little bit of the history and the timeline because I know you it's kind of hard to see here. So um, basically going back to our records, our archives in Washtenaw, um, we have eight books. Um, each book's about an inch and a half thick, dates back to 1945, um, where we have records. So I'm going off to the records that I researched. Um, I don't know, I imagine there's people in the room that have been out here 30, 40 years or more, might know more of the history intimately, um, these are just things I discovered in our archive. So, so our files start back in 1945. That's the first mention of drainage of Portage Lake and the possible establishment of, of a lake level, of, of establishing a, current, a common level on it. Back in 1948, looks like the first initial official action happened. It was actually a petition filed. Uh, went to the courts to establish a lake level on Big Portage Lake. At the time, it did not include baseline. It was merely a petition to establish a lake level on Big Portage, which I think may or may not have been being done unofficially through a lot of bouldered rocks and timbers at the, the downstream end, but I was not around at the time, so I can't confirm that. So, uh, 1949. This was done by the courts again. Washington County Circuit Court did this. They officially established uh, a lake level on Portage Lake of 851.54 feet above sea level. Then we're still in the 1940s. Um, spent a lot of time from the late 40s into the mid 50s with plans being prepared, bids being received and considered to formally build some sort of structure to actually maintain this lake level. Uh, so we, at the time they spent five, six years or so just contemplating what should be there to regulate this lake level, how much is it going to cost. Along comes 1954, there's another petition filed to establish the lake level on baseline rate to include that as well. So. We'll go forward. The court again, Washington County Circuit Court, establishes the baseline lake level at the same elevation, 851.54 feet above the sea level. And if you, you all live there, so you kind of know the lakes do have a connection to one another. So that's 
that's a somewhat feasible idea. Um, we're still in the 50s. Um, we go into the 1960s at this point, where we're 15 years in. Um, gets a little interesting. There is a, a specialist assessment district is modified at that point. I'll go into this a little more in depth. 1961 laws were passed that basically mandate the courts set special assessment districts. I know there was a lot of the questions I got ahead of time. How does this come about? Um, after 1961 and we're at 63, the court does it. The court makes the order, says this is it. And you're going you're to follow it. So uh, I have very little information in the file, however, of the rationale for it. There's not a mention of oh, it should be up to this elevation of properties. It should be riparian ownership. It should be people in a floodplain. It should be people within so many feet of lake. There's, in our archives, there's no information of why the district got set the way it got set. It just shows up as a role. So, um, 1965, they finally issue a contract and said, OK, we're going to put a dam in here. And we did, um, did contracts. There had to be some channel work. So, so Huron River was stretched for conservatively a mile to help help accomplish this. Um, and we did, they decided we're going to put a dam in place to regulate this level, which is the dam that is there now. So, oh, I'm behind. I'm sorry. <coughs> uh, all right. 1967, the dam that is in place um, near McGregor Road uh, opened. It was built and actually was operational. So I was I was born in 69, so that means it is 56 years old. So same uh, dam. Um, one, the, uh, the other thing that happened around this time is in addition to the, the lake level of 851.54, a winter lake level was established. So it was a, it's about a foot and a half lower. There's a little range. It's like 850.09 to 850.24. There's a range for the winter. Uh, court does not mandate when that occurs, but just for informational operational uh, information, we usually coordinate dropping to the winter levels around the time the boat launch um, closes the, the one around the bend. Uh, so when they close the boat launch in usually late November around Thanksgiving or so, we usually coordinate dropping lake levels around that time. All right. Um, 1967. Okay. So um, from that date forward, Washtenaw County was the designated agent to operate the dam. So my office was was tapped to actually operate the gates and make sure the lake levels were maintained properly. And the way we work that is we we tallied up our expenses every year to do that, charged or assessed people on their tax bill for the cost of it, and then sent Livingston County a bill, which then they further distributed their property owners and for their share. All right. Am I still in? Okay. 1979. That's, so we're about a decade in. We start seeing records and documentation of repair and maintenance. There was, at the time, if someone remembers, um, there were boat locks. There's a lock there at the dam. Um, we're getting evidence around that time frame that the locks probably stopped get, really getting used. Uh, around the late 70s, 79 or so. Um, there is, we, we didn't do this, but we, we permitted it. There is a portage. <laughs> it's like, no, so there's a portage for, for people with small boats, canoes, etc., that can get around the dam now, however. 1986, more repairs, more work on the gates. Um, back in 89, more, more work and repairs. The locks for the boat permanently shut. Closed them down. They were in, not being used. Um, and then 1991, um, 
we had an interesting thing happen is the elevation datums we used got updated, so they changed. So we used to use something that we measured the elevation of 851.454 based on a datum that they call the NGVD 29. Back in 1991, that got revised and everyone went to what we call the NAVD 88 standard. Um, it actually, there's a difference in elevation. And where we're at, that difference in elevation was about four tenths of a foot. So just for people that are interested in this, we, when we keep saying we operate the dam, we always operate based on the original court order. So we say we're setting the elevation at 851.54. So it's the same level it's always been through the 60s, even when this datum changed. We didn't change the nomenclature. Uh, we changed the datum and how we, we measure it. But did that make sense? We, we still just kept using the old nomenclature, 851.54, for continuity's sake. So the lake level didn't actually start changing then, but I know it's come up from time to time. People ask about, well, what about the datum? What about what level are you setting it at? We're, we keep the lake level at the original court order at, of the time and have carried that through and made the conversion internally, I guess I'll say that. So I think I have a, uh, Autumn brought a slide up too that kind of illustrates that. So um, back in 2010, more repair work, more work on the gates. Um, and then that led us up to 2023 where we had a gate failure and um, two of the bays were taken offline. So that, that's your, that's sort of the brief history um, of it. So here's the datum thing. I know this, you can at least see the lines. Um, but I, what I wanted to display here is court order said the level should be here. The datums, you know, relative to sea level changed back in 91. We're keep, we still hold to this line. It's the same line. It's just we call it is all. I, I mean, I think hopefully the slide shows that. <clears throat> I'm sort of proud of this. Hopefully people can see this somewhat. This is our lake level. Um, we have an electronic control board out at the dam. So we, we actually have a gauge electronic. It actually records daily while well, it's in real time. But we, we, we output it daily. Um, the lake level. So just for you that can't see it, these are two foot increments. So this band right here is a two foot increment. Here's winter levels over here from like November, December through March, April, or summer level here. And then these, this is 10 years worth of data on what the lake level's been sitting at, at the dam. Yep, that's where the gauge is. So two foot, we're probably holding the lake level. This, I had to say this because I'm kind of proud of it. We're proud of our office's operation. We're probably holding within three to four inches of the lake level any given day, even with all the storms, rain events, et cetera. So it's another common question we get is, is the lake level, well, you don't get asked. I get told. <laughs> The lake level's too high, the lake level's too low. I've been told in the same day, the lake level's too high and the lake level's too low. Um, what are you doing? This is usually what we point to. Like, I can't tell you what's going on in your dock, but I can tell you at the dam, the gauge, what the elevation is, and we're, we're usually pretty close. <clears throat> so. All right. Here's the dam. I don't know if anyone's seen it from the downstream side. You can usually see it upstream pretty clearly from McGregor, the, the overpass, but from the downstream side, um, it's, it's a little more impressive. So there's essentially, there's five bays with concrete abutments between each one, and there's gates on the bays. Um, they're radial arm gates for those that are super interested in it. But so there's five gates. And they, they swivel, so they're they're on a pin, and they can swivel up and down. And it, it doesn't operate like I thought it would operate. So when we raise a gate up, 
It's not that the water has to get higher to get over top of it. What happens is when we raise the gate up, more water can go underneath the gate. So we relate, that's how we get the water levels down. We raise the gate to get more water out, and then the water level starts to decrease. So we actually have five individual gates to do this with. And normal conditions, uh, we do have a local dam operator who lives on Portage that can adjust daily. Our crew can go out and adjust daily. We tend to make adjustments, I'm going to say weekly to bi-weekly, tends to be with one gate. Um, this, the, the lake is somewhat sensitive to that. I mean, we can, we can lower or raise one gate and affect levels a couple inches over a couple day period pretty easily. So there's, I'm not aware of a situation where we've needed to have all five gates in operation at one time. We usually just use the center one or maybe a couple if we get a really big rainstorm. So a couple other things about it. There's an earthen embankment that goes around this. Um, to each side, it's about 400 feet long. I mention that because of those that know about the Midland Dam failure, the big one, it was a Michigan one a few years back. That failure did not actually happen at the Midland Dam. It happened on the earth and embankment. The earth and embankment got a breach. All the water broke through the embankment. So um, not to scare people that's happening here, but uh, usually the, the dam itself are usually pretty structurally sound. It's the embankment we worry about, like uh, tree growth and other things, roots penetrating stuff that can destabilize it. So. And then for those that are sure, this, we can operate this dam up to a 13 foot height. Normally it's about nine feet, so it's about a nine foot drop between upstream and downstream. And then for winter levels upstream of these gates, we can put literally put boards across the bay and block the bay off, um, which we do to protect the gates in the winter so they don't get iced up and, and have problems operationally. So that's, an, that's also kind of a stopgap thing if, if we're having a problem with the gate, we can sort of take that bay offline with these boards. Here's another, I think, I wish, I, I feel bad you can't see this picture because it, it kind of illustrates it pretty well. This is one gate. You can see there's like a pin here and a pin here, and this gate goes up and down. Um, we had a failure this spring where the armature that holds the gate in place, so the water is pushing against the gate, the armature behind it essentially had rusted to the point that it crumpled. The gate just swung down, it was going to break free, and then it got um, stuck or uh, basically hit the hinge pin and got, got wedged into the hitch, in, hinge pin. So you can kind of see it's got a, a tilt to it. Um, I, I guess I'll stop here and say, even if the gate had just totally ripped off and gone, we, we have an emergency action plan. So we did employ it. So downstream of us, Ann Arbor, kayakers, fisher people, etc. cetera, um, we call Ann Arbor, we call their dam operators. There's four or five dams downstream on the Huron. We call Ann Arbor, we call emergency management, we call the sheriff. Essentially they say, well, okay, let's get people off the river in case there's a, you know, a surge of water that could, could you know, be damaging to somebody. Even if that had happened here, we're kind of calculating, it probably would have taken a number of hours for the water level to drop noticeably, even with a free release through one bag. Um, so we had some amount of time. We had a person on site when this was, was happening. And then within the day, you can kind of see them in the background. We slid these boards in. So, okay, we're gonna take the board, we're gonna take this bay offline, shut it off, um, which is what we did. So um, definitely concerning when you get that call, you're like, what? <laughs> What, what happened? Um, but um, we, I think we, we were able to respond quickly. I don't think there was a super high chance that we were going to have loss of property or other catastrophic damage. And we acted quickly to get it sealed off. So um, 
upon inspection, because we, we have the dam regularly inspected, state requires it, and we, we like to do it just to make sure. So every few years we do inspections. This is our year to do an inspection on it. So we were actually arranging for the contract for an engineering firm to do the inspection when this happened. So they kind of sped it up, went in, and said, your other other bay, bay five, but the opposite one, it don't look so good either. You might want to take that one offline. So we took a second bay and put the boards in. So we're currently operating with the three middle gates and bays. The two far ones are offline. I've got, I'm on slide eight of 13 for those that are falling asleep. So. All right, the repair. So, pretty simple. Concrete, for the most part, structurally sound. We don't need to do much concrete work, maybe a little waterproofing, a little ceiling, salt a little bit. But we keep on top of that, do these regular inspections. Downstream, on the downstream headwall, there's a crack that we've had a monitor on for 15, 20 years. It's probably migrated an inch and a half in that time. So we're thinking it's probably a good time to take care of that and pull it back upright to get it anchored back into the, the bank. Um, as far as the bays go, pretty simple. You can take these gates off the hinges. They've been refurbished at least three times in 56 years. We're going to replace them. Just have new gates fabricated. There's actually companies that do this. Um, so we're, 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 we'll, we'll competitively bid that, but they'll go in turn, we'll put boards in, take the gate out, put a new gate in, and then do that for all five. But that's essentially the repair. Uh, a modernization thing we've been talking about is um, currently you have to be on site to operate the dam controls to move these gates. Um, we'd really like to probably have a telemetry unit so you can kind of sit at a computer and do it remotely. Um, we don't have to necessarily be on site. So we, we, we're considering doing that as well as part of the repair. So step one of that is people have to be able to go into these bays safely and not worry about a non-slot of water, 20 <laughs> feet of water coming at them. So we probably will try to do it when the water level is a little lower, when it's winter levels, like down a foot and a half. Um, the boards we use are just pressure treated lumber. Go to Home Depot, pop a couple two by twelves together and slide them in. I, I'm not, I'm not real confident. I want my crew working beyond behind two by twelve treated lumber. So we're looking into getting like three inch oak, something that's substantial that's not going to bust while like someone's standing in that bay trying to take care of these gates. That's what we're working on now. Anyone owns a mill? I did not realize how difficult it is to find someone to cut oak boards. Um, you would think, I mean, how many timber framed houses are there in America? You think you can get an oak timber for me? We're working on that. So. All right, the special assessment district. I'm sure I didn't forget anything here. Um, all right, got a lot of questions about this when, when the notices started coming in. Again, not, I think there was one in, in the mailing. Um, we, e well, we mailed everybody in the official assessment district, the property owner. So every property owner got a, got a notice. We also looked at it and said, hey, there's some funny looking gaps in this that we're not sure why they're different. But they have needed access to the lakes. They seemingly have the same legal rights as a lot of these other properties. Let's just go ahead and notify them too. So you may have gotten a notice because you're in the district and you may have gotten the notice because we, we notified an extra couple hundred property owners. So then you might not be in the district. Again, set by the court. Um, so the way, way these assessment districts work is it's defined as a property that receives benefits has to contribute to the maintenance and operation of the lake level. That, that's really all it says. It does not say property owners. 
So that's why if you own three parcels, you could possibly get three assessments because the idea is we're assessing a property that's getting the benefit, not a person that's getting the benefit. So that's someone like me. So I live in Washington. You know, if I went up to the boat dock, launched my boat and recreated there, I, I got that right, but I don't have property rights to it. I just have personal, you know, freedoms to go and, and recreate there. So I think that's some of the rationale for where, where this came from is did the property receive a benefit versus can someone access it or can someone use it for their for for their you know as a benefit to themselves? Um, there is a process to change it. So if we would like to get it changed, uh, it's a very it's set out in the in the statute. Essentially, what has to happen is we have two counties involved, so Livingston and Washtenaw. Both counties, board of commissioners, their ruling bodies have to pass a resolution <clears throat> that petitions the court to reconsider the district. So BOC passed a resolution that says, petition the court. We want to change it. The court then takes over. Circuit court takes over. They then have to conduct a public hearing for all parties interested, not just the, not just the special assessment district property owners. Anybody that wants to come and offer testimony can. The court then will hear any testimony during this court hearing. They'll hear from the counties, the drain commissioners, water resources commissioners, their recommendations, their engineers' recommendations, and then the court says, this is what the district's going to do. And, and, and that's essentially the process. You don't like it, you can't appeal. If you want to appeal, you have to appeal to the Michigan Court of Appeals. So you have to go to the appellate court to do it if, if you don't feel that the court made the correct decision. Uh, I would say, um, I would I would I'd make the strong recommendation during the initial hearing though, because that process uh, is not borne by anybody but the petitioner. So you would you would you would be paying the bill to to appeal if that would be the case. <laughs> so. Um, <clears throat> All right, I'm not quite to, I wanted to cover this too. So I didn't put a slide up, sorry. But um, my last bit then, and then we can actually have our dialogue here. The assessment process I mentioned. Um, we don't tax anybody for this. Bank commissioner, water resource commissioner, we don't collect money if we don't do any work. So all of you are getting bills every year, yes. Show up on your tax bill, yes. They're more or less constant. But generally speaking, that's because the cost to do regular maintenance and operation is ongoing. We, we do it year round every year. And it's generally pretty stable because we're not doing major repairs like this very often. So <clears throat> it appears to be a tax. But if we did not spend any money, we would not collect any, we would collect any money. So, I occasionally look at people and say, well, I pay my taxes. I've lived here for 30 years. Where'd all that money go? It's like, well, we didn't collect it. It's like we, we literally run a negative balance. So we, we, we borrow money from our county to operate it during the year, and then we come back to zero when we assess at the end of the year. So there's not like extra funds. And then the state doesn't give us money. Counties don't contribute, unfortunately. It's property owner board. Here's another one to make. So, that being said, drain commissioners have to manage that role. And, and Livingston might do it a little different than Washington, but it's probably pretty similar. Essentially, the commissioner is allowed to assign a benefit to the property. Again, it's all about the property, proportional to a benefit. Sometimes that means they'll make a distinction between lakefront back lot access. Uh, we don't happen to do that, but that's that's a, just a common way you could say, maybe make the argument of lakefront is proportionally more benefit than back lot. Um, we generally try to go, I mean, we have to go by the court order, and it, it appears a lot of it's based on needed access. So we do ours pretty much uniformly. 
but it can be done differently. Um, public access generally does not qualify based on commonly accepted evidence. So I know we get a lot of questions <laughs> like, hey, you're probably affecting what's going on up the chain, right? That's how the lake management works with the vegetation, right? You go, you go all the way up to Zuki Lake and be on, the, be on your boat all the way through the chain down to that work. Um, courts in, in the past generally don't accept that even though they might have public access and can publicly get down, if the property owners around those lakes, the properties don't have deeded or private access, then it's usually not considered. Just, just sort of just an informational thing to put out there. <laughs> What we're going to do, though, is when it comes time for us to pay for this bill, because this, this is going to be proportionally larger, we're going to spend some money to do this, um, we'll hold a public hearing. So then the counties hold a public hearing, and you'll get a, you'll essentially get a, a letter that says, you're going to get a bill, it's 0.02% it's of the cost, and this is what it ends up being. It's going to be... $150. Or we might, in this case, I think, because we do have the ability to do this, we may do it over several years. We might say, this is a lot to pay in one year, let's do it over five years. And have a five year assessment or, or a, late, a longer one. <coughs> you certainly would have the right to pay off early. You could pay it off if you wanted, uh, avoid the interest charges. But again, that'll, that'll be seen when, when we figure out how much this ends up costing us in the end. But we'll hold a public hearing. You can come to the public hearing and say, well, I think the only reason you would come is to say, I don't agree with this. <laughs> I, I, I don't like the apportionment as it's set out. So um, I would say this, though. The county cannot change your apportionment. I don't, we don't have that right. The Board of Commissioners has that right. The Board of Commissioners can change your apportionment. We can't because we're their designated agent operating the lake level. What we can do, however, if we find obvious errors, um, it's, again, it's usually not people saying, I'm not getting anything, put me in. It's usually the opposite. I shouldn't be paying for whatever reason. We do have the ability to basically say, we can zero benefit you. Get the same apportionment, we pay zero dollars to pay that apportionment. Makes sense. So, um, if, if you don't like that outcome, you have 15 days again, you got to appeal to the courts. This time it's local court. You don't have to go to the appellate court. But you go to the local court, you can appeal. Uh, caveat to that is you cannot appeal if you don't go to the public meeting. So uh, if you, you're mad and, and, and want to appeal, you, you need to still come to the public meeting. So I, I kind of wanted to cover that because I, I gathered from the input a lot of the questions centered around why does the district look the way it is? I I feel there should probably be more properties, and especially going up the chain, that should be contributing to this. Um, and then, you know, how does the process work? Um, so I, I wanted to kind of cover that before we, we got into the public comment. But really, from from my point of view, that's all I had. I don't know, Livingston, if there was any anything I missed from your end seeing anything in particular but so I'm just gonna remind everyone um, I'm gonna I'm gonna collect I guess I'll do the cards first and then then the zoom that works for you all mm -hmm. so uh, if, if you thought like hey I want to offer comment <clears throat> a question I don't know how many we have so I'm gonna just start out saying hey let's keep it to three minutes uh, and then I'm gonna just go through each card you can either if you want to speak please stand up State your name. Well, if you're able, stand up. State your name, your address. You'll have three minutes. You can also pass. And if you did not fill out a card and still want to speak, then just see Marcella, right? The back. <laughs> you can get a card. Scott, so, yes. Sorry, can you restate the question so that we can hear it up here? If it's someone oh, from the back. Yes. Thank to you. the best of my ability. Yes. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I can restate three minutes of one. So, so essentially what I'm going to do, I'm going to just start going through the cards and then um, I guess I'm going to just say, please keep it professional. I, know there's, I don't see any children present, but I, I don't like being encouraged that. 
um, if we can. So I'm going to give everybody that's here live that actually made the, the effort to come here. You get first crack at this versus the people that, that could come by. So I'm just going to go through um, the list as I got them. All right. So my first card I have is um, James Drolet. James Drolet, Portage Lake. Um, is there any federal or state grant money available for assistance on this program? Okay, I don't know. So, oh, I'm sorry. Gosh, I forgot the first. All right, question was Is there any outside federal state grant type assistance available to pay for this? Uh, my answer is I don't know. So, the state regulatory agency, their acronym is EGLE Environment Great Lakes Energy. So, they're going to permit us. To do all this repair, I'm in conversations with them about that. If if there are some programs that would uh, we could apply to to, to get some sort of aid, so so we're, we're exploring that. Um, but at, at, as I'm standing here, October, I don't know. Um, the next name I have here is Tom Eamon. Can you name and address, please? Um, okay. First of all, how does one get a copy of the PRL for this SAD? How does one find out what your income is and what your expenses are? Oh, okay. So the question is if you're in the, well, anybody, because we're a public agency, so transparency rule. Um, how can you get a copy of our expenses or uh, an accounting of how we spend our money? Is that a good way to say? How the SAD collects money. Oh, how it collects. How much they collect. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, okay. So if you want a copy of, um, so we have an assessment coordinator. Um, the assessment coordinator holds an assessment role of all the property IDs within the special assessment district, at least on Washington outside. But for, for Livingston, we, we just sent Livingston a lump bill and they're they're doing something similar. So I, I think I'm answering both sides of the county line for this. Assessment coordinator does an assessment role. We do track, we have a, an accounting system that tracks all the expenditures directly related to the fluke dam operation and or repairs. So um, if you wanted a copy of that, then yes. You can contact our office. Our, our assessment coordinator can give you a copy of the roll, copy of the the bill. Um, we have a, a flat billing, but a copy of that, and then a copy of all of the expenses that we have expended over whatever time frame you're interested in. Yes, for the Washington side. I, I don't want to totally speak for Livingston. I'm going to assume they they can do something. Okay, so the, the end of that question was about the DNR. Okay, so the 
Yeah. Right. I'd have to ask our assessment quarter, but I can say to so the question about the DNR involvement is we are legally allowed to charge the DNR. There's cases you know, we don't have to say, but in, in our in a lake level case, the DNR is liable for any lands that are in the district. So yes, and theoretically we would bill them if they're in the district, we're gonna bill. Um okay. <laughs> No, the NR, the NR has a, a weird system. I don't want to spend too much time with it. Oh, no, I have one more question. Okay. Why well, do you complement them to the end of November instead of November 15th, like the court established the time for the big hearing? Why do you open Yeah, the, the brief answer with the NR assessing is they're not set up to pay assessment. So what we have to do, if we, we, when we, 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 can, we can bill the DNR, we give them the bill, they don't pay it. Our recourse is to sue them. This is the DNR will say, this is how you do it. We'll pay. This is how you got to do it. We have to sue the DNR. DNR has to pay our court costs to do this. But we don't pay to do this. It's not on you guys to do this. DNR pays the court costs. We have to literally sue them. And then as a result of the lawsuit, then they have a net mechanism to pay. So that's, that's essentially what we have to do is we bill them, they don't pay, we sue them, they pay court costs and then pay the assessment. It's so part of the question was why do you accommodate them by managing the dam to their convenience instead of the court land November 15th? Okay. I so the question is why do we manage the dam to the DNR's wishes or convenience versus what the lake level is? Um, my answer to that is, I, I, I would argue, we do not do that. But if, if I pull back up the data, you can pull the data from our website every every new, we post a new number every day, or every week, I apologize. Um, we operate with the three, four inches of the lake level year round, in my opinion. So I, I would disagree with that statement. I was just going on the statement that you made earlier in this meeting, where you stated that you, you Oh, I, I'm sorry. I misrepresent. I don't do. We don't lower the dam in accommodation of the DNR boat launch. We do it practically speaking because we assume that once the DNR boat launch closes, people are not going to be using their their watercraft after that time period, and there's a reasonable opportunity for freezing. So it's not necessary to accommodate them. It's just that we find that to be a convenient time to say, hey, people aren't launching boats onto the lake anymore after this date. And it's pretty getting to be pretty cold where we could get freezing weather. It's, it's, it's convenient. So I, I apologize. I didn't realize that was your, your thought. So. All right. Um, Do you, does that help? Can Marcella, it's actually behind you. Right. Okay, uh, Keith Gallagher. Keith Gallagher, 9690 Place Road. Uh, uh, thank you for having me here tonight. I didn't think I was going to be here, so I wrote your letter. Oh, okay. If you want me to read the letter, you can Thank you. Um, oh, there's even on the bottom of the card that says it wants to be now. Name and notice. Uh, next one, James Brady. Questions you can ask. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so am I, I'm going to ask. Um, so the next one is Patricia Hughes. I have a question. Do you want me to read it or would you like to speak? Okay, so oh, yeah, I got Patricia Hughes from Pleasant View of Hinkley. She wrote, um, "What would the river and lakes look like? The water level if the dam, uh, like the or like the one in Dexter, was removed?" Um, I'd like to know that too. Actually, I I don't know how deep the lake is. We have some knowledge of it. Waves. What? I'm sorry. You still live next door to Mr. Clay? Okay. 
and uh, they used to graze cattle on Porter's Lake. And that's what it would look like. Right, so basically a mud flat. <laughs> At some point, 80 feet deep, where here's yeah, but it's two of the small feet deep. I would say, I mean, the, 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 what I do know is at the dam itself, we, we get about nine feet. So it, it probably would drop at least nine feet. I don't know what that would do to the footprint. I live on Tamarack Lake, and I think that's a spring bed. And so we talked, tonight we talked about how Portage Lake was established and how baseline was then added to it. How did Tamarack Lake get involved? So, so the question was, so we talked about Portage got it, it has an established lake level, baseline has an established lake level. I'm going to expand your question a little bit. Um, Tamarack Lake is in the district. Little Portage Lake is in the district. They're not named with lake level. So I think the question is, why are they in? Um, I don't, again, our records from the court order in the mid 60s that set this district, I'm not sure what criteria they use. I know we've heard elevation, we've heard needed access. It, it may have been an elevation thing. I know Tamarack is materially affected by the camera operations, that it, it, it will respond in kind. I don't know how directly. I don't know if we haven't done that. I'll, I'll, all right. Full disclosure, I'm a licensed engineer. So I, I'll start. What is it? Licensed engineer. Um, part of this is I don't know how far the lake level dam influences stuff upstream. I can guess based on I think I you know, does it extend up to affecting what's going on in Zuki Lake? I doubt it, but I don't know. Um, if I wanted to find that out, I don't have the money to find that out uh, without spending someone else's money. So that, that may be something that comes up when we're trying to figure out what should this assessment district look like. All right. Um, so, I'm going to so I have Bonnie Swanson. So this was a, a comment um, uh, that that there is a feeling that the lakes upstream of these four are also affected, and it should also properties should be sharing the cost of this. Um, we, I, I am going to say, I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm breaching any secrets here. Is um, this repair is going to be more than just your average maintenance? We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. So. Um, yes, totally agree. This is the time we need to go to the court and say, is this really the right district? You know, so that is fully our intention before this repair and start having to pay for it. Um, that we're going to examine just that question of like, what should the district be? What properties are getting benefit from this? So yes, I, this is not something we want to wait on either. All right. Our right, next one. So, Mark Teacher. Welcome, Mark. That's okay. So, you don't have to repeat what I say. My name is Mark Teicher. I'm the president of the PDWA. The first thing I would do is I would contact. Open into your address. 9380 Dexter Pinkley Road, Dexter County. So, being the PDWA president, I dealt with both. Uh, Water Resource Commissioners for many, many years. I would compliment them. They have been responsive. Their staff have been responsive. Uh, really good people. They assisted in creating the SAD for the invasive plants. The invasive plants, again, under the statute, was who's affected. So for the invasive plants, that originally was all the way up to Strawberry Lake, 
it was that homeowners properties on the lake paid x whatever x was and anyone that had that had needed access to the lake would pay half x so that was i think about forty thousand dollars to liberty title company way back and that information's already uh been done so that would be an easy thing to figure out uh it appears certainly uh and speaking for myself, not the PBWA, but that in the same way that if, if properties are going to benefit from the dam being redone, that if everyone pays a share or a half share and money is distributed more evenly, uh, uh, it really seems like it's fair. I brought the Riparian Magazine and happens I'm the Vice President of Michigan Lakes and Stream Association that deals with dams across the state. And I ordered a few extra and I have about uh, 15 of them on, on my table in a cardboard box and I wanted people to take them. If you're a PBWA member, you get it as part of your membership, but if you don't, please take one because you can then see the MLSA website and you can go through all the archive uh, information or articles about dams and it's a real education uh, about dams, uh, the court cases, and whatnot. Uh, secondly, I tell you that as an attorney, I've assisted organizations around the state in creating uh, special assessment districts dealing with dams and basic plants and amending the size of the SAD is not that difficult to our complex. So I, I think it, it can be done uh, relatively easily. Of course, when you deal with the courts, I'm not sure anything is going to be easy depending on the judge. Uh, otherwise, um, I would I would tell you that uh, Washington County has been kind enough at PBWA to allow us to do several dam tours for our members and we walk across the dam. It is a lot of power. It is loud. Uh, it, it, it is a lot of water. I think it, it, it yeah, I would agree to that that there's a danger in that amount of water from trying to repair it. Um, but it's a uh, uh, certainly a necessary thing. So otherwise, uh, I'll leave the box on the table, the magazines, and then thank you. Thank you. You, you brought up a good point. I, I didn't mention this, but um, we do. We, we have, you know, uh, safety signage and buoys and stuff upstream of the dam to keep people off. But some of you might remember a few years ago, we last time we had an incident where some of you, you've seen those. Um, those are like the aluminum boats with the outboard motors. Um, we did have have some 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 boaters um, lost power to their boat, and the boat um, ended up drifting against the actually not the abutment, but the there's an I beam where these these boards sit upstream of the dam. Just to demonstrate what what he was saying about the power of it. Um, when I came back out there a few days later, the aluminum boat was 100% folded over that I mean completely crushed down into a space of about a foot. I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of, you don't notice it when you're upstream how much power that water can have. So, sorry for the other side. Um, um, John Toigo. Thank you very much. Uh, doing a great job, by the way. Uh, John Toigo, uh, 8219, CJ Landing, Pinkney. At the schools. Uh, thank you, everybody else. For, I heard a few of my questions already answered. I did. I did note that there are about 20 dams in the Huron. What I think it's called the Huron River watershed. And one of the things I'm wondering about is how are those other dams uh, managed, and are they assessed to uh, private owners in the same manner as as what's proposed here, or are those somehow on the public road like uh, like streets? Okay. Uh, so the question is, is in regards to the other dams up and down the Huron River watershed. There are some, I think that might be right. There might be upwards of 20. Right, right, 20. Yeah, that sounds about right. So we're a part of, so we, we operate one dam on the Huron River. We have other dams on other, like Rail Run, for example. We have one dam on Huron River that we operate in Washington. Uh, Ann Arbor operates like five. Um, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge. So how are they operated? Who pays for all of those? We have something, um, we, we, we have a dam operators network. So we meet a couple times a year. I'm part of that for our group where we coordinate 
with all the other dam operators. So like, for example, if, if we have to do something unusual when we do this repair, like we want to, we got to take a gate off and, and have a bay run free release for a while. That's more what we did with the dam operator network and coordinate all that. So downstream, Ann Arbor can go, okay, we're going to expect an additional inflow of water. We can make adjustments. We do the same thing in very, very unusual rain events when we get these five, six inch rain events. So there's a net network that we try to coordinate and work together so people aren't working against one another. As far as who pays for all those, I'll actually say I don't have that kind of knowledge. I think it's a it's a very patchwork. I mean, I think Ann Ar the citizens of Ann Arbor <coughs> pay for some of the Ann Arbor operations. I don't know about all 20 of them. I think the point that I'm looking at that I saw uh, in my online research was all heading up towards the origin of the river. So, uh, what was that? North of us. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. looking at anything south of us. Yeah, there's some south. Yeah. Yeah, if I just may follow on, I keep trying to think of it. You mentioned the, the grants, and I, I just want to note for the record that uh, the Huron River, the parks, uh, now they've extended the parks almost right to the dam now. So it's my sense that not only are there benefits to people upstream towards Zuki Lake with respect to the, to the Huron River and its management, but downstream as well, it seems to me that besides DNR capitalizing on the lakes, we have Washington County and the whole Huron River Park system, which is capitalizing on the lakes and the maintenance of the, of the watershed as well. And I note that they spent about eight hundred thousand dollars in improvements just recently along that parkway to include over forty million dollar in grants that they got from the state of Michigan and from the DNR. So I feel like under those circumstances, there should be something that we 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 can do. Yeah, I, I the question um, kind of started about the state of Ann Arbor and some and some grant opportunities again. And, I, I don't know how optimistic I am, but I do know one of the good things that happened as a result of the Midland Dam failure is there was a, a much broader recognition that this sort of infrastructure needs care and upkeep. Up, you know, upkeep. Um, you know, we we have gotten grants before. Like I do have a grant to work on some dams on the Willow Run. Those are to get rid of those dams, <laughs> but but. Um, I think to your point, whether it's you know National Wildlife and Fisheries, whether it's Eagle DNR, I think that's something we definitely want to explore if there's some opportunities that would be applicable to a lake level dam structure and its rehabilitation. Um, next one, I have, I have four cards up here, so I have, next one is Jay March. You answered my question about the, uh, when, you're, when you're going to lower the lake. Oh, oh, it's on. I'm sorry. All right. Oh, this one. I'll just. Uh, this one says has questions on the back. Again, so Ken DeLabel. Uh, sounds like I did it read it, or do you want it? Uh, Ken DeLabel, 27 Town Village, Northside Base. Like the answer to the assessment question on the back. So I do have another quick question. Okay. Um, how many parcel properties are in the assessment, and what's your time frames to start um, the project? Okay. Thank you. How many properties are in the district in our time frame? Uh, I believe there's 1,200 properties-ish in the district, um, roughly. And, uh, what is it? It's 45% Washtenaw, 55 Livingston, or the opposite. It's, it's somewhat equal between the two counties. It's 55-45 between the two. Um, and then the timeline, um, I, I'd like, I don't, I, I'm, again, I, I'm having trouble believing it's so hard to get white oak milled. <laughs> but um, I'd like to put the, the permanent, like the, the, the sturdy boards in. I'd like to do it with the lake level lowering in, in November, although I don't think that's going to happen because I, I can't seem to find a mill that's willing to cut, cut three inch oak for me. Uh, the idea, however, would be we would, we, our engineering firm would lay out a timeline where Probably by mid next year, we have the, the repairs accomplished. Thank you. Right. Um, other one, 
Uh, so Kristen McFaith, do you want me to just read or do you want to talk? I'll read, I guess. So Chris McFaith and Base View Drive and Think Tank um, has a, a, is a similar question. Why would a special assessment district only consist of forage and baseline lakes? The special shouldn't the special assessment district also include tamarack, whitewood, gallagher, balloon, strawberry, and doofy? Uh, if the dam fails, wouldn't that affect their property as well? So I think we kind of addressed that somewhat. So, all right, last card I have. So I have uh, Mark Ford. Uh, Mark Ford, 8912 Riverview. I live next next to the dam. And so I'm wondering about what your contemplation is of the work that's going to be done. Will it you know, be mostly on one side or the other? That property that's next to it. So I'd like to kind of understand what you're thinking. Yeah, I would suspect, I, I mean, we haven't really thought through that yet. Um, probably talking to cranes, bringing in, bring in a crane to do this. So uh, I will, we have, we have easement access, of course. Um, I would, I can stay full. Question is, how, how would we affect the repairs when it comes time to do it? Um, we, we probably are going to access to the U of M property, I'm, I'm assuming, get a crane with a long enough boom to reach. Um, and do it from one side. If we have to go from both sides, um, we would restore, restore it though, because that's going to damage the yards. So my yard shouldn't be affected by it because there is plenty of space in the easement, but if it were, I would like to know that. Yeah, yeah, I think um, the immediate neighbors are certainly going to be notified, um, I guess, a little more intimately of, of activities because clearly. This is not going to be unnoticed, and, and we don't want to disrupt the neighbors to the point where they can't conduct their daily lives. Okay. Yeah, one more. Oh, okay. Um, I have the Kevin Radcliffe. Yep. Uh, Kevin Radcliffe, 8755 Grove, Pinky, Dexter Township, Orchard Lake. Uh, most of my questions were answered, but the one that was answered, which I would guess is probably not even possible but uh, possible to change a sad like this so that it is a funded balance sad over time versus an assess as things come up I can I okay so the question is could we change the funding mechanism or the fund the, I guess the funds accumulation the fund accumulation uh, process for these lakes I do not believe the statute I don't, I'm not an attorney, <laughs> but I don't believe the statute has. I'm not uh, an attorney either, but I don't think you yeah. can. I don't think you can collect funds in advance on lake levels. I think it's only, you can only assess for what you've already done. Crane law does allow for a small annual amount of advance assessments. That's the lake assessment. I believe does. I'm also not an attorney. Okay. We'll see. We think that in cases we get to that time, we'll look into that. Okay. I mean, it, it doesn't help us now, it's unfortunately, unfortunately yeah. but it just came to mind when this came up. Why isn't there a pot of money sitting there? I mean, it's pretty typical for there not to be, but. Um, and then my you know, other question was related to the potential expansion of the SAD and the analysis of the waterways up to do the. Uh, we've already indicated that we don't have that information. We'd love to have it. I'd love to have it. I think it's important that we find a way to at least get something on it, uh, whether there's anything available, uh, you know, in Michigan records or county records or something to know that what are the set levels. You know, obviously, we remove the dam and drop nine feet. That's going to affect our property. But are they really getting a benefit from the 18 inch up and down, you know, that we do uh, you know, semi annual basis? Yeah, so the question or comment really centered around getting data and an analysis of really what what what's the upstream effects that the dam, you know, what's the radius of influence? Yeah. I, have a, I, have, I know you have a card in. Do you have, did you put a card in? I did. Uh, okay. James Brady, uh, 1194 Camelot. Oh, thank you, Richard. Um, there, I believe there, the GA, one of the, the, the department, 
we, we, they operate the, all the satellites, uh, uh, GPS. And they do all the measuring also, and I think they just measure the lake level all that way uh, to show that the dam affects the lake level all the way up to Seek Lake, <laughs> even Portage. Yeah, I, I would or, think or it's are we even going all the way up to war. Yeah, I mean, speaking like from the engineering standpoint, I could sort of foresee how we would look into this, doing this sort of thing. Just even some basic topographic information. And, you know, we might, you know, we definitely work with Livingston. Because, you know, it's one thing if, you know, the Zuki water level or the shoreline level is around 852, it says one thing, but if the shorelines at Zuki are like at 875, kind of indicates something else. And if that, that's something that we would, we would start that investigation. With that, that kind of analysis, and then start going through probably a hydraulic model and figure it out a little better. Oh, wait. So, is there, just before I return, do any return questions, I do want to get to Zoom people. Um, is there anybody that still wishes to speak that did not get an opportunity? Okay. I do. At least if you can, you don't have to do the card now, but if you can do the card for the time being, just your name and address. Yeah, you can give the card later. Yeah. But Don Radebaker, 95.7 um, We've talked about a lot of private people that brought up the radio you can kind of see here. Homeowners, what role, what um, does a really new home in the University of Michigan has all that property at one site? And the private businesses. Yeah. So the question is, within the special assessment, there's <laughs> different property classes. So we got university property, retail, commercial, DNR, etc. Um, again, you, you you could make some arguments that they might deserve a different report. The property may deserve a different proportional benefit, but they're all subject to the to the benefit and the assessment. So. Uh, you know, the, the, the yacht clubs, the, the retail establishments, they, they get a bill too, not just private uh, or residential class. You have family. That's, I didn't want to have to say this, but I'm gonna, that's one of those, I'd have to get back to doing that. <laughs> we have another, yeah, have just quickly. In the past 50 years, the maintenance has been taken care of, as you said, where you do the maintenance and send the bill to the county or whoever, and then they reimburse you. At what point in time did this not become that? What is there a dollar amount that triggers this? Um, so the question is, so for 50 years, we, we operate the dam, send out the assessment for a bill to Livingston, they pay us back. And then I guess your question is, how, how or if that has changed? How is it different? Um, going forward or currently, I guess. Right. Yeah. Why, why would it be different going forward? It, it, not, it wouldn't necessarily be different going forward. I think because of the magnitude of the monies involved, now we're thinking, we should look at this, that, that this is the time to look at it. Because it's one thing when you're getting a $19 bill at, at, at a year. It's another thing when we're trying to, I don't want to throw out a number, we don't, we're not to cost estimates quite yet, but when, it's going to be several hundred thousand or, or more. I, they're just the magnitude of things is why we're. The, the magnitude of property value in that 50 years is it's gone up 100 times. Okay, so tax revenue from those properties, you know. Well, Ed, I guess to your point that, that despite whatever the property values increases are, and despite whatever the tax base value is or taxable values, we don't realize any of that. So, the maintenance fund is generated by the IRS and so no, it is not. It's like I think our bill last year was 19 bucks, but it is not at all tied to taxable value. 
So, so I've gone through all the cards. Oh. Are there some, have you had a chance to speak yet? Okay, so Tim, we'll do a card, but in the meantime, name it. You just name it. Yep. Tell us again how people were notified of this meeting. Okay, so um, yes, how were people notified of this meeting? Um, we have a social media coordinator, Autumn. I believe we did some posts and stuff. This social media, which I'm not in, I don't do the book of faces. So, but what we officially did is our assessment coordinator worked with Livingston County and said, "Can you give us the assessment role?" They provided an assessment role to us. We took our assessment role. Everybody on the assess, every property owner in the assessment role got a notice. Then we took the map and looked at some of the subdivisions in the immediate Portage Baseline area that have seeded private access to the Portage or Baseline Lakes. And we notified all the properties in those subdivisions. And that, that was the official notification outside of like the news articles and the. So, like, essentially the same uh, group that got notified about the program? No. It was a different different group than the weed control group. The year before last week. Right? Oh, I don't know that. Last, So we did not did not notify anybody at like Duke and Strawberry officially now, unless you saw it in the social media. That's something going forward. I hope you will So essentially, we have a comment that uh, perhaps we should have notified a little farther up the chain. Finally, who's the decider for Livingston County? Is it the county or the county? The decider of what? The decider. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not following. To do the assessment. Okay, yes. Is it the county commissioners who make that? Oh, it's um, the, 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 I'm sorry, Brian, I don't know if you're a drain commissioner or a lot of resources. Okay, so the drain commissioner. Pardon? The drain commissioner. The drain commissioner. Drain commissioner. No, it's the circuit court. Well, no, the assessment. Right, but the, 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 he's not part of it. Right. So in order for him to be part of it, it required a change from the sandwich, prior report to the side, there would be public hearings and everybody that was affected potentially would be noticed. Yeah, I don't know how the court would notify for that, how they would decide what. If they were going to include in the SAD, they'd be required to do that. Well, they the wouldn't, public hearing. I don't think they would, they wouldn't hear testimony until the public hearing. So I don't know, if, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if they would know in advance, like, should, how far should we go? Right. You know? Well, that's going to be part of when they did the public hearing there. They would have to propose what the new staff would be, and they would, if you're going to be impacted by it, they would have to notify you. So you can have a chance to have a voice as a public hearing. We got two different questions here because we're talking about the assessment and we're talking about the amount. The drain commissioners of four counties determine the amount. No, well, the drain commit, we, we do. So the district, who pays is set by the court? How much you pay, we don't set how much you pay. We just decide, we just take whatever we did spend and then pass that bill along. So we're not choosing how much to charge you. We're just, we take our accounting and say, we spent this much here, and then yes, the drain commissioners then actually get the bill, collect the money. And, and it, you're going to determine based on this how much it's going to cost. So towards the end, what we would normally, well, what we will do is we're going to competitively bid, get the lowest responsible bidder for these repairs. There's <laughs> we're going to a contract with them. We're going to borrow money in some fashion. We don't have the money in advance, but we borrow the money. 
to do this, or borrow the money, and then then there'll be the public hearing where you get, if you're in the assessment district at that time, you'll get the, the notice that said, here's your apportionment, what, this is your share, you can come to a public meeting. Our right, I'm going to be an hour, don't pay it back. <laughs> I'm gonna. Did you? Did you, you talk to them? I did not. Okay. Um, Mary Beth Timmerman, 11598 Cedar Bend Drive. So, can you talk a little bit about the timeline? So, there's a couple things I'm hearing. One is um, the work that needs to be done on the dam, and then the other one is basically who's going to get assessed. Right? So, if both counties have to pass a resolution and petition the court. <clears throat> That's one thing. Yeah. And the dam repairs, the actual repairs, that's another thing. And then yeah. how they're going to get assessed, that's even another thing, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's the end of October. Can you walk us through how and when all that's going to happen to do something on the dam this winter? Because that's like coming up pretty quick. Yeah. And this sounds like a really long process. Okay. So thank you. So the question revolves around timelines of how how and when is the district going to get examined, how and when is the dam going to get repaired, how and when are we going to be looking at like meetings to get assessed. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not, I, I've been at the county 27 years, I've never done this. Months ago. Yeah, I know it. Uh, so, the grain of salt is I don't know how long the court process takes, how long it takes to schedule hearings, how long. One, we took off on it for caution, but it's not technically it didn't fail. Just to clarify that. Uh, the other three gates uh, um, are in similar condition to the other. So the timeline is crucial. Um, as an engineer, I, mean, I don't panic because I, I mean, we look at these worst case scenarios like what's if worst case scenario a gate blows out. What we're going to do is we're going to go there within a couple hours. We're going to put these boards in upstream and that gate, lock it off. It's, it's, it's probably, it maybe got the water level three, four inches. But, but it's not middling, you know. Um, but on the other hand, does our dam operator, when he goes out to the gate, he pushes the button to raise the two inches? You know, kind of. Cross his finger a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at this great oh, post, I have another. Sorry. I'm just going to say so we don't know the schedule now. Scott's been focused on the technical. He's looking into what the legal process is going to take. We've got a website. We've been updating that regularly. So I think the main takeaway here is keep an eye on that website. You're working with all the office, but we're going to continue posting regularly, at least every two weeks. 
and more frequently if there's more stuff coming up. So we're going to start knowing more about, hey, this is what it looks like with this part of the process. We're still working on the final schedule. And so, you know, it is, we're still talking in the terms of months and not years, but I'm with Scott. I've not done one of these before, and I've been doing it since we started this long as I And this is my first program now that I'm viewing with. I thought I'd have to go. Anything in the infrastructure world that you could have, but I guess not. Is there an entity or a team of people that is working on getting that expanded? We're working to review what's fair and who benefits in the SAG. That may or may not be expanded. I know everyone here would like to see it expanded. Keep in mind that it was originally established and brought to do a bigger project than what we're doing today, you know, cost adjusted. And I can only imagine if people wanted that district to be correct that time. So we are certainly looking into that, the legal piece, the schedule, the technical work, and how to do the communication piece of things. And Scott is having regular meetings with the, the design and legal. Well, it sounded like what he was saying that we have a petition in court. Is there a petition already started? I mean, we. It's pretty obvious that it needs to expand it, be expanded, at least a few lanes up, maybe not all the way to the beach, but at least a few lanes up. Can we go ahead and petition the courts and get the ball rolling? Yeah, I'm going to cut you off. I don't want to cut it. I don't want to start using it now. Okay. Oh, it's okay. 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 <laughs> Um, yeah, the petition again, remember. So, both counties, two counties involved, both counties need to pass a resolution to do the petition to the court. So, yeah, that's that's where we're starting now on that. Yeah, great. Like, we're having those talks definitely with the, the commissioners whose districts involve these lakes. Certainly, they, they're the, you know, the closest to it. They've championed it. We're going to put on the board agenda. Um, but we also want to have our ducks in a row because we don't want, if the court surprises us and says, hey, we're going to have a hearing December 6th, and, and we don't like, have a proposal for them on what the district should look like, we're going to be scrambling. And so we're going to try to suss that out. Sorry, but you went full opposition for it. I don't think that's You went to the So we had a question because we're not a comment on these real quick about uh, whether what the late level they have to be somewhere. They have you know they there's have. the point. There's the point. Look at the late level, look up the I guess that's I, what it is. I would, I would say like a lot of these questions and comments are centering around who should be in the district and who shouldn't be. And I, I guess that's the question that ultimately the courts decide this, but pragmatically both of the great commissioners who are resources need to come up with a recommendation and have a plan on their side. So that's the thing we're, we're, we're kind of grappling with too is what what each office thinks is a fair and equitable way to approach this. I, mean, I, I don't know if any one of these suggestions hit it exactly or not. So, um, I do want to get, I don't want to ignore our, our Zoomies. So I'm going to pause to see what questions we haven't experienced from, from the, the online world. All right. Uh, if you have a question for everyone online, down at the bottom, you will see a smiley face that says reactions. Go ahead and click on that and uh, raise your hand. I'm going to start with the people in the chat. If you did not put in your first and last name and your address, um, I'll just call you out and you can unmute yourself and um, feel free to ask your question or just provide your last name and address and I can go ahead and ask your question for you. So we're going to start with Sue. Did you get your question answered? Sue? 
All right, we will move on to uh, Neil Murawski, uh, 5108 Edge Lake. Two questions. What are the ratings, good, bad, fair, et cetera, for dams throughout Michigan? And the chart for Portage Baseline Lake over 10 year period, how far back this data exists for lake levels? Okay, so we have two questions. I think they're somewhat new. Um, the latter one was, how long do we have data going back for with the lake level where we track it basically daily? Uh, I think 13 years, I believe, where we electronic, where we can get the figure, the figure to tell us to the hundredth of a foot what it was. So 13 years of data. The first question, I can't believe it. The dams across Michigan, oh, the radiance. Okay, so this is a good one. So about how dams are rated. Um, Lake level structure is regulated by the state. This particular dam, we're required every three years to have an engineering inspection on it. The inspection report uses fair, satisfactory, poor type of language to describe condition of the dam. So they don't use a numbering system per, per se as like good, fair, poor, satisfactory type of thing. And then they provide a recommendation and a report for actions that they perceive need to happen in the next three years. All right, next we have Josh. Josh, did you want to provide your last name and address? You can go ahead and unmute yourself or, or put it into the chat. I'm trying to get on board with this, by the way. My children are much <laughs> All right. Um, Milt, did you want to ask your question? All right, we have Jim Sita at 11190 Algonquin. If the total estimated expense is 400000 and there are 1,200 properties, the cost per property would be $333 per property. If this is billed over five years, the cost would be $66 per year. Let's make sure U of M and the DNR also pay their fair share. I am not in favor of remote controlling the dam without an option to override it locally. It seems there are, I lost my spot here. It seems like software gets hacked or does not work properly all the time. The yeah. sooner we start, the better. Yeah, I'll answer that later. So there's a question about possibly remote operations at the dam and some concerns. I think they're very rightful that we lost control of that, that somebody could do bad things to us. Um, we, we, that's part of our discussion with the engineering group is uh, we always want to have local control, so there, will, there would always be local control. If someone could go out and locally override everything, push buttons, and do it right on the dam site. And we have a local operator of Portage that could, could get out there quickly. Um, we're envisioning this being, yeah, a lot of my bailiwick, but uh, he, he did like an encrypted type dual secure system where we would have cameras upstream of all the base so someone could visually see what was going on. So you're not just pushing a computer button and hoping something's happening, you can actually see on the camera the gate actually moves. Um, so we'd have a, a camera set and then the security portion of that, I guess I'd say I'm mindful. We're mindful that that's, we don't want, I don't know if a terrorist would want to take over operation of this, but you know what I mean. We don't want someone, hacker, trying to give us ransomware to take over our damn operation. So yes, mindful of computer security. Uh, next is Howard Burroughs, 9760 Stinchfield Woods Road. If you don't believe you should be part of the assessment district, was what is the process for appealing? Okay, so just to reiterate, if you don't, uh, more than likely, you're, we're probably going to get everyone that is in a proposed district. You're going to get a notice of a court hearing, um, 
and on what a new district is going to be. If you want to appeal that, then that's the one I talked about where you have to, you have to go to the Michigan appellate system and go to Michigan appeal court to appeal. That would be the process for if you're in or out. If you want to appeal to you what your number is, that's the county level. You have to go to the hearing first. You have to go to the hearing. Like a problem. Right. I think I've never done that. You have to contest it first with the county. Uh, Howard goes on to say, I'm in 100% in favor of remote operation. It allows for much more uh precious and much lower cost most of the concerns relate to cost let's automate okay. we have a, a comment that we should automate to save costs <laughs> paraphrasing now um then we have um adam miller adam can you provide your address for us yes can you hear me oh yep we can hear you yeah eight six eight five mc Gregor, and my question, and first of all, I just want to say thank you for the presentation tonight. It's been in, incredibly informative and really appreciate the work you do on behalf of the county and the state. And just two questions. What is the current estimated total of the cost of repair? And secondly, I want to say that I fully support that our dam is up to standard and rated at the highest quality. Thank you. Did you hear? Oh, <laughs> he wants to know um, the estimated cost for repair. And then um, fully support that our dam is up to the highest rated standard right now. And thank you for the presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, how many people did we, did we get online? Uh, about 75. We got about 75 people online. I know I, I get some people get a little antsy, so I appreciate that. Pat. Uh, and again, I'm not, they work for the government, so I'm not really that offended that you walked out on me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so um, one of the questions is reiteration of what's, what's an estimated cost. Again, I, I don't know of a time where I have not regretted giving out an estimate when I wasn't pretty confident in what, what the final number was. So I, I am going to punt on that and say we are uh, we're looking at several hundred thousand up to a million or so. It's going to be a real broad range, but um, it, it's. You know, I think now we we so your nineteen dollar bill for those that washed it off. We you could probably do the math anyway, but um, I think we spend in total twenty grand or so a year, roughly. So for twenty grand, you get a twenty dollar bill. We're talking magnitudes higher. I, I'll just let me finish through these. And, uh... All right, I do not see any more. Um questions in the chat and I don't see any hands raised. Did anyone else have any questions or, or comments to address? Okay. So we did have one live. I don't know if you can have a comment. Say say the same thing kind of we were you. I know right after the failure of that one game that you had, you had an engineering company come out. What's your progress and timing on them going through with progression of repair? <clears throat> okay, so we, as he, as he noted, we did have an engineering firm within a week of the failure. Thanks for engineering, it's a company that just knew it come uh, out at the dam site with the structural ex experts looking at it. To date, um, they have provided us a proposal with a full task list, like, Pass one through 55, this is all the stuff that needs to happen. Here's the scope of work to get you from step one to 55, which number 55 would be damage repair. Done. Um, the scope, timeline, cost estimate, and it's in my court now, it's in my hands, where I'm analyzing that, deciding if I think it is a reasonable quote, um, and a responsible use of your funds to enter into a contract with them to, to do that. Um, I would say, not giving away too much, the only question I have right now is I'm a, I'm a little skeptical of the cost to put these old boards in. The cost to me seem 
like they're higher than what they should be. And I'm trying to, I'm right now, I'm exploring, literally calling up the yellow pages, lumber mills, going, can you mill three inch oak thorns for me? Going through that process. Because it's, in my opinion, it's as simple as I just need a three inch oak board that's a certain length. Um, so that's, that's essentially where we're at. So if I, once I exhaust that avenue, then it's just, I'm going to execute a contract with an engineer. Who makes up that uh, decision for the approval of accepting what they give you in post? That, that is that rest of the to your office? That's me. Okay. Me in our office, yeah. Is there a reason why you couldn't do steel stop blocks as opposed to Okay. Because it the sounds like that's, that's yeah. the wood seems to be a, at least a stumbling block. Yeah. So one question is, can we use different things than wood? Different like, material. You use aluminum, metal, steel. Um, I, I don't get super into it. Yes, because um, my initial quotes, and this is, you know, initial quotes, put steel uh, boards in over 75,000. Okay. My, my initial quotes to get both boards in, 65,000. I'm just, this just seems insanely high. Yeah, I, I can. I, I, I'll just, so when I was a teenager, I did. I was a timber cranker. I literally. That's what I did. I we got nine by twelve volt timbers, and I know they didn't cost those sixty five thousand dollars for to put up a timber frame bar. I'm a little stuck. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I've got I got two live questions. Everybody got to talk once. Zoom got to talk once. Um, my last one. Um, just did Doug call me? Is Doug on here? Yes. Did you get your question there? I, I think I'm not sure, but I think so. I, I don't know what point you picked that up. Okay. All right. Is uh, Christy Meyer here? Okay. Um, Christy Meyer does not live in the assessment area of this and here at River downstream of the dam. Um, she has questions. Um, is there any thought of replacing the dam given its age of 58 years? Um, our initial assessment, we did have a full structural inspection. We did not feel that was necessary. We felt that the repair would bring it to a level of service equivalent to its a new condition. Um, uh, let's see. Since 1965, development upriver has increased. China, climate is changing, which I would concur. We see a more significant rain events and concur, and technologies have improved. Um, how long do you think this game can function in my life? Um, again, I think a 50 year lifespan is that's a, that's a good estimate when we're putting something in the ground. To, for, for, for a good lifespan. We've reached that. Our analysis says the structural integrity is pretty good. We think, based on the 56 year history of the gates, that we can get a good 30 years or more out of this. So I'm not going to say ever need to repair for 30 years, but we think we can get 30 years or more out of this. Yes, <coughs> um, information. I've seen the date indicates the dam is not at risk of failure. Is there any planning for such an event? Um, yes, there is. We have an emergency action plan. It's updated regularly uh, in the event of a, a total failure. So a lot of it's notification, a lot of it's getting people off downstream roads, getting people off the river, getting people off the shoreline, uh, and then a notification network that branches out. There. And then also that plan includes some contingencies like what are we going to do in the event of this? The gate fails, we're going to put the boards in. That, that type of thing. Concrete wall falls over. <coughs> you know, like okay, we're going to make a call to some big construction companies. You know, the ones that work on the highways get some equipment. So yes, we have a plan in the event of a catastrophe, a burn, the events of failure. Um, 
I'm sorry? Just the verbs. They, they inspect the verbs as part of the inspection. Because you don't want, like, you know, gophers and animals burrowing into it. And like, like um, willow trees, for example, their root systems seek out the water so readily they just really mess up the, you know, the integrity of the water tightness in the burn. So, yeah, that's a part of the inspection, making sure the burrows uh, are, are looking bad. Okay, and uh, David Bone. Um, does that operation of the dam affect water levels of the upstream lakes? Probably, but we're not, we have to look at it. Uh, has the dam ever been operated to control the levels below the dam? Uh, we don't, so we only, our dam only affects water levels upstream, and our grant operates in, we operate, we communicate, but they operate independently. Um, and then there's a question about how the assessments. So I think I got through everything. I got through online. I'm I'm going to say, is it probably reasonable if we make it till nine? If there's any other follow-up questions, so I'll I'll, I'll say I know we have at least one, and then we'll try to wrap up by nine. Okay. So I know we have control that and three all got I understand what the right one from the book manager said, well let's share the local. Well, having been to a few special assessments and put them in the sewer the tell you that if there's any emergency with any work that needs to be done in the time, try to change the assessment. My uh, folks volunteering to do the rush reading to do the USAP to drag the process out for years and years and years. So I caution the great commissioners to understand that. You know, if, we, if we have a problem that's got to be fixed over the next 18 months, and we start volunteering people from this time and everything, they start to do the other way. And it's a real question. As to whether or not this dam really affects the lake level. And they question that. They can drag it out. We just did a quick math doing about five by 1,200, 300 plus private by five meters, 100,000 meters. That's not a good side of the Be careful what you wish for. Volunteer to somebody else to do the SAP. And they're not here today. The defendants are the state of the position. And I say, we've got people in here. And why don't you put in place? And they want to confront that to the gallery of the construction of the city of the city of the city of the city of the I think that's a matter of things up there. Uh, tornado warnings went up at the Western Township on the North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. I've got that. There was a notice today that there was one of the uh, sirens in the Township. Yeah. 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 I guess there were tornado sirens earlier today. There's three several in a row. There was a question. It sounds like when someone found out that they were having some technical problems with the with the alert system, and it wasn't um, a, a result of an actual like the uh, keep the congregation just follow. Um, while it may be difficult. It seems that there is there, and if we can get some data that finds us the truth about the extent to which the folks upstream are impacted, not only in the summer, and letting the water down in the river, that data says that maybe more people should share. Very fair. The second thought is, 
We pay a lot of state taxes. And as we saw the uh, state budget that came out this year, it seems that the state has money to be very, very generous. And one would hope that we can do whatever we can to get the state to help us. And this important thing that affects a lot of people in the county and affects the whole state. Thank you very much for what you do to try to get ahead of it. Please let us know what we can do to make our voices heard. Okay, thank you. And again, I know you reiterated the question of the upstream. I, 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 do, I do want to keep reminding you, and I think the board safe is due to, you keep saying the people, the residents upstream. I think the court's going to revert to is the property of the stream receiving a benefit. Now, are the people receiving a benefit? Which, might, in my mind, a little different question. Is the properties of the stream receiving a benefit? Um, definition. Oh, public act. So, oh boy. Public Act 451 is the EPA Act, the Michigan's EPA Act. 1960s. Oh, no, I'm sorry. 1991. I'm conflating. Uh, Public Act 451 is part 307 of that. Yeah, it's on the internet. Search. You go for part 307 of Michigan. It's all in Michigan. It's not a And court, the court sets a public hearing, and the public hearing may hear testimony yes. from all interested parties, including the respective counties and their recommendations. And then the court says, this is what it's going to okay. be. So it's not like we're going to vote on it. Okay, we don't really get to say in that. You, you can say, you can do testimony, and you, you could appeal. Okay. But, but it's not like they're going to say, everyone raise their hand. Right. Okay, I'm not going to keep it up with forever. So, um, thanks everyone again. I know we did it. Thanks, I Thank you all for sticking with us. All the chairs. We got out. We can take this drone. PowerPoint presentation up onto our website before you look available tomorrow. So if you can get all the dog out of your website, uh, you should be able to find both the recording and the PowerPoint presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to our office by email or give us a call. And we will do our best to see you guys.